section, we're going to be looking at the significance of a chemical equation. So let's write an example first. We'll take uh, gaseous hydrogen, which is diatomic, reacts with gaseous chlorine, which is also diatomic. Oh. And that yields uh, hydrogen chloride. Now if you look, there's two hydrogens and two chlorines over here, but only one on this side. So again, you have to come over and balance that out with a coefficient of two. Now these coefficients uh, indicate the relative amount of reactants and products in a chemical reaction. And it also indicates sort of the minimum amount of uh, each item required to satisfy this equation. So for example, you could take one hydrogen uh, molecule, one chlorine molecule, and if you reacted them, you would get two molecules of hydrogen chloride. And similarly, uh, because these are relative uh, amounts that are true for all reactions between these two chemicals, you can scale this up. So you could take 10, 10, and yield 20 molecules of hydrogen chloride. Or if you multiply it by uh, Avogadro's number to get one mole of hydrogen, then you would also get one mole of chlorine yielding two moles of hydrogen chloride. And you'll see this property of uh, like coefficients being uh, multiples of one another or having the same common factor rather, is important for when we measure to try to get a uh, reaction that has the ideal amount of uh, reactant to yield the amount of product we want. For example, if you want to make uh, exactly two moles of hydrogen chloride, you should probably use one mole of hydrogen and one mole of chlorine gas and if you used one mole of each, then you would end up with exactly two moles without uh, wasting any extra reactant. And if you were to do this reaction in lab, where you would have to measure out uh, the amount of each reactant in grams, you could again use the uh, mole ratio, or the molar mass rather, to figure out how much of each uh, element you would need in this case. So for example, if you were to take the one mole of hydrogen, which weighs 2.02 .02 grams, per mole, cancel them out, and you get 2.02 uh, .02 grams you use in total. Similarly, if you were to take a mole of chlorine, and then its uh, molar mass is 70.9 grams, you would get 70.9 grams of chlorine that you'd have to use. And similarly, if you were to take the two moles of hydrogen chloride, on the other side and multiply its by its molar mass, which is 36.46 grams per mole of HCl. Cancel it out. You would get that the total mass on the reactant side would be 72.92 grams, which is exactly the sum of the constituent uh, reactants that go into the reaction. And this, of course, obeys the law of conservation of mass. That is, when you transform or when you react this hydrogen with this chlorine to yield uh, hydrogen chloride, you're not destroying any mass. It's the sum of the mass of the hydrogen and the chlorine that went in. Now, because chemical equations can be thought of somewhat like algebraic expressions, where the one side of the arrow has to be equal to the other side in terms of number of atoms of each element, this means that these equations can be reversible. So we'd know that two moles of hydrogen chloride could conceivably break down into one mole of hydrogen and one mole of chlorine. That is, much like an algebraic expression, a chemical equation can be written either way and it would still be true quantitatively. Now while these equations are good tools for indicating how atoms interact on a 
molecular level as well as a macroscopic level that is with the moles and whatnot it doesn't indicate whether or not a reaction will actually happen or the speed at which a reaction happens and we'll discuss those two factors later so now we're going to be working on balancing chemical equations I'll do one or two examples uh, for you in this video and then there are extra examples on pages 272 through 274 if you feel like you need more practice alright so we'll start off with something simple like uh, water breaking down into its constituent components of hydrogen and oxygen. Now water, which is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, in which hydrogen has an oxidation number of 1 plus and oxidation and oxygen rather has an oxidation state of uh, 2 minus. So again to find the correct formula you cross the two numbers so you get water has a formula of H2O and when you break that down you get hydrogen and oxygen however if you'll remember hydrogen oxygen and the halogens are all diatomic as lone elements so this is our non-balanced equation however it does have the correct chemical formulas for all three chemicals that we're going to be using now the next thing you have to do is balance out the equation so that it obeys the law of conservation of mass. That is, you have to have the same number of hydrogens and oxygens on one side as you do on the other. And the way I like to do this is keep a sort of running total of each element on each side. So right now there are two hydrogens and one oxygen on this side, and there are two hydrogens and two oxygens on this side. So obviously an oxygen can't just appear out of thin air, no pun intended. Uh, so what you have to do is use coefficients to balance out the equation. That it, Those are the numbers that go out in front here. Remember, you can't change these subscripts because these chemical formulas are true for all molecules of hydrogen or of water, rather, hydrogen and oxygen, it's never going to change the actual chemical makeup of each. So you have to change the amount of chemical that is used or produced in the reaction. So really the only system for balancing out these equations is trial and error. But we'll start off with some logic. There's two oxygens on this side and one oxygen on this side. Now we can't get any fewer oxygens in the reactant side because it's in its most basic state of just one atom. So what you have to do is then find some way to double the amount of oxygen in the product. So what we'll do is we'll add a coefficient in front of the water. Now what happens then is it doubles the oxygen, great. So now instead of one, you have two oxygens on this side. However, you've also doubled the hydrogen that is in this water. So now instead of having two, you have four hydrogen, which leaves a problem over here where you only still have two hydrogen. So what you have to do is then change the number of hydrogen molecules you use because again to get the balanced or to get the right coefficient for the oxygen we had to double it and that results in the hydrogen so we can't just divide it to fix it up again so what you do is you add a coefficient in front of the hydrogen molecule in this case a 2 to double the amount of hydrogen to get 4 and once you have the same amount of each element on one side as you do on the other, then your chemical equation is balanced and you can use it for measuring out uh, chemicals for reac reactions or what have you. Now in case you didn't understand that, I'll do one more slightly more complex example, but that's because the last example was pretty basic. So you can react aluminum sulfate, which we know sulfate has is a polyatomic ion with calcium hydroxide, again hydroxide is also a polyatomic ion, and that will yield aluminum hydroxide and calcium sulfate. Now again we have to use the charges to get the correct formula on each side. So aluminum has a charge of plus 3 sulfate has a charge of minus 2, calcium has a charge of plus 2, and OH has a charge of negative 1. 
now when we do all the crossing and whatnot, including for the reactants, we get the chemical equation uh, Al2 with three sulfates and calcium hydroxide yield uh, aluminum hydroxide and calcium sulfate. Again, the way you do this is by crossing over the various uh, oxidation states for each element or polyatomic ion in order to get the correct chemical formula. So now once again we'll do our running total of elements on either side, treating polyatomic ions as though they are single atoms. So if we quickly scribble out a chart for the products, or for the reactants rather, and the products. All right. Now if you count it out, there's already one calcium atom on either side. So, so far there's balance. Those are balanced. There's two aluminum atoms over here in the reactants and only one over here in the product. Now there's three sulfate atoms compared to one over here and two hydroxide ions compared to three over here. Now there's the same amount of calcium on either side so right now we're good with that. So we'll come back to the top. There's twice as many aluminum in the reactant as there is in the product. So what we'll do is we'll put a coefficient in front of the compound that uses aluminum in order to double the aluminum on this side. But you'll, what you'll see is that also affects the hydroxide in the, re, in the products, rather. So that will double the three. So you now have six hydroxide on this side and only two on this side. So what you have to do is then triple the amount on this side so that you can have six hydroxide over here as well. But what that does is that will affect the calcium, again because they're attached in the molecule, so that you have three times the calcium that you had before. So again you have to come over here and insert a coefficient to balance the amount of calcium on either side. So now you have matching calcium at three piece, matching hydroxide at six apiece. However, this three in front of the calcium sulfate threw off the number of sulfate ions. So now you have three sulfate ions over here. But if you look, we already had three sulfide, sulfate ions over here. So when you compare the total number of atoms and polyatomic ions on either side, you'll notice that they all match up once we've done all this balancing. And that tells you that this chemical equation for this reaction is balanced correctly between the products and the reactants.